<clears throat> so over there on page uh, 88, they talk a little bit about a corporate deed. If there's property held in a corporate, uh, you probably may run into this three or four or five times. There has to be some authorization for that person to sign on behalf of the corporation. Ironically, it's funny. I own property in a corporate name. When I went to sell it, the title company goes, well, Raymond, as do you have permission to sign for the corporation? I'm like, uh, I don't know. And they said, we need something stating from your secretary of the company that gives you permission to sign for the company. I'm like, but uh, I'm also the secretary. They're like, okay, just write the letter. Seriously? Okay. So I wrote a letter stating that Raymond Modulin, the person, has the power to sign for the corporation, and I signed it as Raymond Modulin, the secretary of the corporation. And they took it. <laughs> that was like in the military. In the military, you had to, Cameron left, he could verify this. In the military, every time you go in and eat, you had to sign your name. Well, after a while, they started using initials. Well, we had to have a document saying that our initials represented our signature. And then we signed it and initialed it. I'm like, well, wait a minute. How is my signature validating that my initials are my signature? Because it's me. Same thing. So if you ever deal with that, make sure you think about that in advance. Your The title company should help you. Hey, this is a corporate own property, we need some kind of declaration from the corporation saying that, you know, Ross can actually sign as the president. You probably won't run into that a whole bunch. Over there on page 88 and 89 are all the documents or all the deeds that we went over. And we went over this thing called a quit claim deed. That's where we jump over to that page there. There is one other deed I want to talk about. It is called a uh, trust. And we talked about ownership of property into a trust. And at that particular time, no one asked me how you get the property into that trust. That is one of the forms of ownership. Remember, severalty, some form of co-ownership, or a trust. Well, when a person does this, they become the, anybody? They are the ones doing the action. They become the trustor. And then they would deed the property into this artificial person called a trust who is run by the trustee. This should be review for you. So the trust owns the property. Now, suppose there's a situation where I, as the original trustor, need that property back for some reason. I want to borrow money from the bank, and the bank says, do you have any collateral? Well, there is a free and clear rental property, and they're going to go, well, that's cool, but you don't own that, so that's not your asset. I'm like, oh, okay, so hold on a minute. I call the trustee and say, hey, invoke clause, paragraph 7, article 23, and Deed me the property back because I need it. So the trustee could actually deed the property back to me. If it comes back to the original person that put it in the trust, it is called a reconveyance deed. Re meaning back. Conveyance meaning transfer. If it transfers back to the original trustor, the trustee would use what's called a reconveyance deed. Literally, I'm just redrawing that picture there on the bottom of page 90. If the trustee gave it or, or deeded to anybody other than me, it would be a trustee's deed. Very important to understand. If it comes back to the original person, it's a reconveyance deed. 
if it goes to anybody other than me, it would be conveyed to a trustee's deed. And when I put it into the trust, it would be called a deed of trust. Sometimes you hear them called a deed in trust. You will see this situation when we get to the financing section, when we start talking about the, uh, yeah, the second way to own property, title theory, the title theory method. You will see this. So the trustor deeds the property into a trust using a deed of trust. If the trust deeds the property back, it's reconveyance. If it goes to anybody else, it's a trustee's deed. Make sure that you get those straight because they like that. Make sure they don't, they try and confuse you. Understand who the trustor is, who the trustee is, and read the question. If the trustee deeds it to someone else, that would be a trustee's deed. Now, there's one other deed I want to talk about. It's called a deed pursuant to a court order. Sometimes a judge will actually order the property sold. We talked about that thing called partitioning with joint tenants. There are cases where someone wants to partition out their interest in a joint tenant, and I have seen judges order the entire property sold because it couldn't be done. It was too um, hard. Let's just go with that way right now. And the judge could order the property sold. That would be a deed issued pursuant to a court order in a estate situation where an executor might sell it. In a divorce, the judge could order it anytime. If the judge orders the sale of the property, the only way you know this happens is because Remember, I mentioned that very generic clause that said for $10 and other good and valuable services in a deed issued pursuant to a court, court order, it will actually have the full price listed. So instead of that generic $10 and other good and valuable services, a deed issued pursuant to a court order would say $125,500 or other goods or services. This way, the judge has a legal document that got recorded and now he knows I've got to split this amongst whoever it is, husbands and wives, joint tenant partners, business partners, whatever. This keeps a person from selling it and telling the judge, well, I sold it for $10. Here's that guy's $5 I'll keep. And he really sold it for this. So when the title company records this deed, they will record it with a true number just for the purpose of doing that. All right. That is a deed issued pursuant to a court order. And the only way you know is because of the price. Thumbs up. Cool. Let's talk about a transfer tax. A transfer tax is used in some states. Indiana is not one of them. But remember, this is a general body course in case you would ever want to maybe, hey, get a Florida license. You're going to need to know this. Florida uses this transfer tax. The transfer tax is nothing more than exactly what it says it is. It's a tax placed upon it by the state to receive some income for doing the transfer. So you actually have to pay this. Now, it can be paid by either party. I've heard agents tell me, well, it's most often paid by the seller. I had one guy tell me the buyer pays it. I do not think that there is any standard protocol it can be negotiated in the deal just like everything else can but it's based upon the sales price now here's the confusing factor in this section there are two ways to do the math 
And remember, I've often said numbers are numbers. Well, this is a case where it's not really true. So everybody get your calculator out and let's go through how to calculate the transfer tax. <coughs> now, based upon the way they ask the question, will dictate to you which method you use all right and there are two great examples one is the florida method one is the new york state method new york says it is um nah, let's not do it that way new york will say it's 50 cents per $1,000 of sales price. It's 50 cents per $1,000. So if I sold the house for that 125.5, the question you need to ask is how many thousands are in 125,500? I hopefully have done easy math for you guys. It is 125.5. Everybody see that? It is 125 and a half thousand dollars. Think of that thousand dollars like a packet. How many packets are in 125.5? There's 125 and a half. You would just literally multiply that by 50 cents. And the answer turns out to be, what is that, 62.75? Somebody check that math for me. 125.50, yes. So the transfer tax in that scenario is $62.75. Thumbs up. Everybody get that number? Now, there is a second way to calculate this math, and we need to understand. So watch the second method. It's going to say 50 cents per $1,000 or any part thereof. See the difference? The first one was 50 cents per thousand, flat number. This one's 50 cents per thousand or any part of a thousand. So what this one is telling you is you cannot have a partial packet. Any part of a packet, is an entire packet. You cannot do any portion. So in the same scenario over here, how many packets are there? Anybody? Sleeping in today, huh? There are 126 packets. Because you cannot have this half, it's 50 cents for every packet or any part of a packet. Now, it's 50 cents this transfer tax is $63. Make sure you understand 50 cents per thousand, or did the question ask 50 cents per thousand or any part thereof? Thumbs up. Cool.